Trials are familiar and obviously attractive set pieces for filmmakers, with the stakes at their highest, the protagonist and antagonist clearly defined, and the holy grail of narrative filmmakers, the ending of the story gifted to you, the verdict, which is the climax of the proceedings. And uh, today we are going to highlight six movies that include trials, but they may be at the end or in the middle or throughout the movie. We will find out when we reveal those choices. Before I reveal those six choices, uh, two uh, chosen by each of my guests and two from myself, I would like to mention some of the movies with trials that came to mind when we put this um, episode together. Uh, and they go back to the religious trials I remember seeing in uh, Carl Dreyer's 1928 Le Passion de Jeanne Arc uh, and Ken Russell's The Devils, a movie that kept me, uh, kept me, uh, gave me a week of sleepless nights. And Robert Bolt's A Man for All Seasons. And then there are those cemented in contemporary issues of racial justice, such as To Kill a Mockingbird and A Dry White Season, those that uh, cover issues of sexual consent and assault uh, in the Before It's Time 1976 lipstick with Anne Bancroft standing up for Margot Hemingway and the better known 1988 The Assault with Kelly McGillis supporting Jodie Foster. There were Native American rights in 1974's The Trial of Billy Jack and War Crimes in the uh, recent Official Secrets with Keira Knightley. We have also had uh, several did they or didn't they thrillers like Jagged Edge with Nice or Is He or Isn't He or maybe he is Jeff Bridges and Presumed Innocent with Harrison Ford and of course Alfred Hitchcock's witness for the prosecution. There have been courts martial in the Kane Mutiny, Paths of Glory and A Few Good Men and the more traditional um, criminal trial juries in 12 Angry Men and the rather less successful The Juror. There have been surreal court cases in Orson Welles' 1962 adaptation of Kafka's The Trial and traditional ones such as the 1948 movie of Terence Rattigan's The Winslow Boy. Familial trials in Kramer vs. Kramer Moral dilemmas like Dead Man Walking with Tim Robbins and A Time to Kill with Samuel Jackson and Sandra Bullock. Political showdowns like In the Name of the Father with Daniel Day-Lewis. Police corruption in Serpico with Al Pacino. Cynical lawyers like The Lincoln Lawyer with Matthew McConaughey and The Verdict with Paul Newman. And a, a wonderful early 1982 David Mamet screenplay, by the way. Trainee lawyers like Julia Roberts in the uh, run-of-the-mill Pelican Brief. And paralegals, again with Julia Roberts in the much better Erin Brockovich. And literally cowboy judges, a saloon-keeping Paul Newman in The Life and Times of Judge Roy Bean. A character also played by Walter Brennan in Gary Cooper's The Westerner, which by coincidence is the first film I noted down when I was bought a diary for my 14th birthday and used it to list all the films I would go to see. I still keep this diary up to date. And even though they weren't in my uh, original introduction, but because my two guests, uh, when we weren't recording, uh, insisted I mention them, I will now add two wonderful comedic movies with unconventional counsels. Uh, in the American sense, uh, Joe Pesci in My Cousin Vinny, and of course, Reese Witherspoon in Legally Blonde. And more recently, um, very contrasting, uh, a based on truth um, trial, which I think was um, shot for Netflix, the trial of the Chicago 7. And that concludes um, my list of trial movies before we go on and talk to those suggested by my guests. Joining me today as we put movie trials on trial are human rights lawyer, and a regular movie-going companion of mine, um, Susie Labinjo, and screenwriter, director, and regular improvised comedy companion of mine, Lee Apsey. And I would like to welcome you both and go straight to Susie to talk a little bit about uh, one of your two movies, pretty much a template for uh, sort of courtroom dramas on cinema. It's the iconic uh, 1962 adaptation of Harper Lee's book, to Kill a Mockingbird, directed by Robert Mulligan and uh, starring, amongst others, Gregory Peck. As Luke has already um, introduced, it's based on Harper Lee's novel and it actually is um, was written from her childhood experiences and it's actually set in the 
depression in the 1930s in the US. And it's from the children's point of view. So there's a little girl called Scout who her and her brother and their neighbour are all friends and they, they spend a couple of summers together essentially losing their innocence. And the film is about um, generally about the loss or the destruction of innocence and also racial injustice in the sort of deep south in uh, the 30s. It's interesting because when Luca asked me to, to, to think of films to pick, this was the first one that came to mind. And I then went away and, and, and watched it again and it threw up some some quite surprising things that I hadn't I hadn't actually I hadn't thought of when when I originally picked it. But anyway, to go back to sort of a synopsis of the film, it's um it's beautifully shot in in, in black and white, and um it's quite uh, there's lots of scary bits in it because it's from the children's point of view. Everything, there's lots of um, the, the neighbour who they're afraid of. There's, you know, dark that they're walking about in woods and, and darkness and all that sort of thing. But they're also extremely principled and courageous children. And their father is this lawyer who has a, um, you, you know, he's a man of great integrity. Um, there's some strange scenes where he's, well, there's a strange scene where where he's called upon to, to defend the jail, which is a very odd thing. I, I'm sure that wouldn't that wouldn't actually happen. Well, I hope it wouldn't actually happen in reality. But there's no doubt in your mind that he's a very principled man. I think that the there's an initial scene where one of his clients is too poor to to pay him and pays him in in food. So you know, there's there's no doubt in anyone's mind that he he's the good guy. And when the sheriff comes along, and not the sheriff, the judge comes along and asks him to ve- defend a black man who's been accused of raping a young white woman, he doesn't bat an eyelid. He just says, yes, I'll, I, I'll take the case, even though the whole town, well, not the whole town, but the majority of the town are essentially against this poor man having any sort of defence. In that sense, it's quite black and white. You've got, you know the good guys and then you have as i said there's a scene where the um sort of mob turn up at the the um jail to try and uh prevent the trial and 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 meet out vigilante justice uh it's it's quite clear that there's some sort of the baddies in in that mob although you know there are a, a few characters who are persuaded to by the children um, to let uh, justice run its course. I suppose, in a sense, because of because of the kind of work I do, although I'm not a criminal lawyer, a lot of it is about fighting for the underdog, fighting causes which are generally or may be unpopular. Certainly, so I suppose it's um, it's was that the fact that it's um, Atticus Finch is there defending a man who most of the town think um, shouldn't be defended and um, the sort of work that I do myself and and in my firm is generally about, often involves um, causes which um, most, well, a lot of people wouldn't wouldn't support. What you've drawn out as the kind of the the, the principle at the heart of it about um, standing up, uh, a legal practitioner standing up for someone against whom the vast majority of of that person's community have already made up their mind. And uh, I think there's something that uh, resonates uh, across cultures and across generations uh, when you depict a sort of struggle for justice in those terms. But of course, it was also, as you said, set in the 30s, but it came out in 1962, which is the the, the, the epicentre of the civil rights movement in mm. America, where American audiences will be relating this 1930s struggle, which is also reminiscent of the true case of the Scottsboro Boys. Uh, they'll, be, they'll be relating that to the current kind of political struggle of the civil rights movement. So it's both, I feel, looking back on it, a, a document of its time and something that that's, that has, you know, a sort of more also kind of universal appeal. Lee, 
Do you remember this film? I, I remember watching it as a youngster. So well. I want to say thank you, Susie, for putting it on your list because I watched it for the first time yesterday and finally got around mm. to watching it. It's a classic film, and all I've I've always heard about it. And, you know, I always hear like you know, it's a a good lawyer who stands up for the the right thing. He, he's and he's like the, the greatest hero of cinematic history because he stands up for right. But in the film, he's it's tragic, and he's played as a it, it at least from how it came across to me that he's naive for thinking everyone's going to play law correctly, that his speech would mean anything because he does the work. He seems very clear that he's right logically and ethically and morally. And because, I mean, a courtroom is just, just a room. It's people agreeing to have laws and acts. So just the people go, no, and don't go with it. And this man who spent the whole time just believing, like, if if we do things by the book, the law is right and you should, should always follow the law. And that kind of changes him to the point that at the end of the film, he goes, actually, all right, well, just we'll cover this up. We'll go outside the rule book because the systems that are there aren't set up to help people necessarily. Well, I think that's particularly, I think that's particularly uh, uh, relevant in 1962, mm. although it's relevant today as well in many, in, you know, in many countries and, you know, to a certain extent in this one too, because um, yes, we can tell it. Atticus Finch fails. Uh, the jury returns a guilty verdict and and the innocent man is actually mm. killed. Uh, we can say that because that's not the end of the film. No. And but what we do learn is, as you said, uh, the, the process that we've set up doesn't work. And so and that's what you need to take to the street. Mm. And that's 1962. Susie might tell us that that's. And I, I, I'm going to put this to you. How often do you feel that the system, as opposed to an individual case, that the system as a whole is wounded, is inadequate, and we have to go outside of the court system to get justice today in the UK. Can um, I put you on the spot? I, <laughs> well, the, the, the thing is, unlike Atticus Finch, I, I don't think we should be going outside the criminal justice system to, to get justice. I mean, I think that, that um, sometimes it doesn't produce the right results, and but, you know, to be fair, we're not in 1930s or 1960s America now with, um, you know, in, in a situation where uh, poor old Tom Robinson's there with an all-white jury. And mm -hmm. even if there hadn't been all, an all-white jury, it would have, difficult, would have been difficult for him to, 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 to get any justice in that era. You know, the criminal justice system isn't perfect. Of, mm. There are, and I, I deal with um, compensation claims for miscarriage of justice, so I, I know it's not, but I don't think that that means that we should just, um, <laughs> we should just uh, <laughs> defer to the mob for, <laughs> for, for justice, because that, that doesn't pr mm. produce the right result either. I think what, what we need to do, and certainly what we should be all be doing in, in, in every era, is just making sure that um, the criminal justice system works um, in the best way it possibly can, all the, you know, um, and sort of making changes to it where things are not working properly mm. and where things do not produce the right result. But no, I agree. It's a very bleak, a bleak outcome in that it's, it seems to be ultimately saying, yes, there's this man of integrity. And mm. um, ultimately, he just says, okay, well, fair enough, Sheriff. <laughs> it's also, it's also, like sort of, uh, even like sort of like a storytelling sense, it kind of almost has to be a tragedy because even if he convinced that one jury in that one town with a great speech and saved one person's life, you'd still come away from the film thinking, but what about the millions of people who don't have an Atticus Finch in the room? Well, actually, I mean, that's quite an effective yeah. call to action, I guess, but still. Yeah, it's yeah. that's why I, I almost disagree with Luke's original introduction about... Um, courtrooms being inherently cinematic because you have a, a climax where there's a verdict given to you because you can't, I mean, in, you know, if uh, everyone's fans of Joseph Campbell, you can't necessarily end on the, the status quo stays in power and this one time someone's let you off or someone's shown clemency. That's why normally, you know, the greatest ending of all time is Rocky where there are literally judges, but they don't matter because he's, he's found, he's, he's sort of destroyed that ego and found like uh, absolution in just trying and deciding to love. 
I mean, good luck just deciding to love yourself with vast systematic oppression. But you know, that's that's, that's from a, a script writing set. Well, that's and also part. someone who's clearly aware of the corruption amongst judge, judges at, at boxing matches, mm. which is um, <laughs> uh, which also makes um, they are they are the equivalent of all white juries in Alabama mm. in the nineteen thirty. Or maybe not. Or maybe not. Can I ask um, Susie what the what were the things you noticed recently when you watched it that you had a, that came up? Oh yes, it was it was the the, the white savior mm. issue. So there's Atticus Finch, who I mean, obviously, um, <laughs> in, the, in 1930s um, South, I think if you'd been if you had managed to become a black lawyer, you wouldn't have. I mean, you know, it it would have been even more hopeless. Um, so it's just it, it is that kind of white savior figure that um, Atticus is a moral hero. He's also, you know, here he is. And as he passes through the courtroom, all the black audience doff their caps. Um, and then you've got the issues with um, Tom Robinson, who's quite a 2D character. Mm. He's not fleshed out at all. He's just this this guy who sort of is there in, in the courtroom. But, you know, we don't get any rousing speech from him or any, you know, very much. This is a guy who's, you know, essentially fighting for his life. Mm. You would have expected more. Or mm. even... Calpurnia, the, the the family sort of housekeeper, mm. she also has a very sort of limited two D role. I've I've heard that um, it, it was just in the sense that apparently I haven't seen it, but that Calpurnia's role has been fleshed out a bit more in the play, and I, I presume that sort of you know because the film and well the book wouldn't probably wouldn't be. Um, published now and the film wouldn't be um made in the way it was now they would certainly be looking to do something i would have thought something um more with the the black characters um so so that that was really the the the, the white savior thing which was what i hadn't um i hadn't really thought about or or remembered from it One thing that we've highlighted is that where the justice system fails in, in the eye of the, the viewers of these movies, because in Mrs. Doubtfire, which is uh, the film that you, uh, one of the two films that you've brought to us, the court case is around divorce and custody of the children. But so you're absolutely right. Uh, the, the story isn't resolved in, in the courts, um, is it, Lee? It's resolved outside of them. Uh, but I'll allow you to introduce the film and let us know um, why uh, you chose it. Uh, for those that aren't aware of it, it's Christopher Columbus's 1993 movie with a cross-dressing uh, Robin Williams. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, when we were off air, uh, a very handsome Pierce uh, Brosnan uh, in a swim swimming costume, but uh, and there's a lot more to the film than that. Uh, oh, Lee, I'll leave that. Pierce Brosnan's actually a good lead into it because there, there's things about Mrs. Doubtfire that just I remember it was growing up with it, and it blew my mind in terms of filmmaking. One of the best choices ever made, and this was done between drafts when they got Pierce Brosnan in to play the new love interest of uh, uh, Sally Fields as his character. Um, they, he was originally like a bad guy and he was smug and, and slightly sort of mean and there was a reason to like Robin Williams have to get in there and save his family from him. But they just made him the nicest guy possible. He's really lovely. He's a good stepfather. They go out of the way to establish that his family is happier with him not being, well, not, be, not being the husband part of the family. The second half of the film uh, in what Blake Snyder would call bad guys closing in where, you know, the threats get bigger and everything gets more dangerous. It's the dinosaurs are loose in Jurassic Park and the fences are down. There, in Mrs. Doubtfire, it's his family flourishing and being really happy. Because the thing that makes this film work so well is that Robin Williams is the cause of absolutely every problem in the film. I'll come on to the court in a second. But it is all entirely driven by him being envious or him being careless or selfish. 
and that kind of drives it round to like action as character as plot. It's perfect on that. It's very very efficient in ways I could talk about endlessly. I do want to flag up though because I watched it um, sent to what um, Susie did with um, To Kill a Mockingbird. I watched Mrs. Doubtfire again yesterday. And I was expecting, I was like, there'll be some things which will age poorly. I'm going to try and lean into Benefit of the Dow. And, and, and large parts of stuff I can try to excuse in it. But then there's like about three or four lines of just randomly, just frankly, just cruel transphobia and one really weird racist joke out of nowhere at the end. If I, can, if I could take a copy of the film and cut those out, I, I prefer it. But I think it'd be remiss not to acknowledge it for a film that largely does so good at talking about caring and forgiving and there's a, a million ways to be a family the iconic harvey firestein is in it in a clearly mad i mean they can't be legally mad but married type situation with scott capuro and the whole family knows and there's no art there's no nothing about it it's just lovely and wonderful because it's just a casual queerdom in cinema which is brilliant and yet it does uh it has a few bits that are just frankly nasty. It was it was a great choice not to present the the um, you know the future husband who's going to replace mm. um, the, the protagonist as some kind of villain who's going to be mean to the children because uh, because that's divorce custody battles they're not about choosing between you know uh, uh, a saint and a villain. Mm. Uh, they're about negotiating, you know, a new set of arrangements at which the welfare of the children are at the heart. But of course, this film is really about the adults, mm. and it's particularly about Robin Williams. But he does go on; a, he does, you know, and he's very irresponsible, as you said. Um, but the, by the end, he does acquire a, a greater degree of self-awareness, and he changes his lifestyle, doesn't he, in order to be uh, a more stable and protective father figure. Though the point I was making earlier was. It's not really the court hmm. that, that that affects the transformation. He's constantly resistant and kind of rebellious in the court. Um, he's learning is done outside it. But however, um, you want to know something about those scenes. So yeah, they um, obviously the, the the climax of the the film. They come back. He's he's through his own actions. Uh, he, he sabotages a, a dinner because he's a jealous, envious man and, and makes all sorts of mishaps directly caused by him. It's great. Um, the, the charade is unveiled, uh, and a few months later they go back to court, and he gives a very honest account of himself and why he needs to see his children. And the judge just openly goes, nah, me, a stranger who doesn't know you, who's been put in this role, I say no, you don't get to see your children unless you have a, um, you know, a, a, a supervision. Um and it, the, the salvation comes after that, where uh, Sally Fields goes to him and just she gives this great uh, speech to him, where she says, "Like I don't, I'm tired of who did what, who wronged whom." She's basically saying, "I don't care about punitive justice." Essentially, she's saying, mm -hmm. "I I want you around the children. The children want you around the children. You want you around the children." It, it is through our agreed relationship is what's actually going to work. If we let go of what we are trying to force us to be and we don't uh, take on the, the, the law, uh, legal enforcement, that's that's the resolution. It's it's through, it's, again, it's agreement. It's, it's through people talking, being honest, and then doing what do we need to lead good lives now rather than winning in a courtroom or punishing something for what he's done wrong. I mean, they, I'm sure he broke a lot of laws that he don't really go into, but at the same time, it would have been satisfying if he just, you know, said if he'd successfully, he's got this job now. So the judge goes, okay, you get the kids. That doesn't repair the, 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 the rift. That doesn't repair the important thing in his relationships. And that's, that's what they've got to come to terms with, you know, uh, it's forgiveness. It does. It, it, it avoids that neat, uh, packed, ending that I said earlier, the, uh, the kind of the narrative structure of a trial can deliver us. It did not deliver it. It's, it's interesting, though, because I, I do think that, um, that uh, I suppose the family um, courtroom dramas, the, the, the custody dramas, mm. if you like, they're sort of slightly different because obviously the family are going to have to come, some, come to some kind of accommodation and those um, battles are not best for in a courtroom. Mm. 
So I'm going to confess now to both of you, I only watched Mrs. Doubtfire for the first time last week for this podcast, mm. because not long after it came out uh, in the UK, the mother of my two daughters and myself separated. And although we agreed on shared care, the story has always been too painful for me to watch. And I've avoided it ever since, uh, even though it's almost 30 years. So mm. I was wondering, because you chose the film, Lee, does it have any personal resonance with you? Um, yeah, I mean, it's a very strange mirror, actually. I was going to ask, really, did, you, did it sort of, did it feel straight? Did it bring memories? Because they don't hold back on, like, the harsh part and the arguments and stuff in this. Well, so, no, because time, time was enough for me to watch it now yes. without without revisiting the pain uh, that I, one inevitably goes through, however positive the outcome. So I, I have a very strange mirror to that, uh, because part of the reason I pulled this up, and uh, part of the reason I have um, a very specific relationship with this film was um, my, uh, my parents uh, separated for a while when I was about 12. Um, and the end of this film, which again is very jarring, given that it does have... Uh, some half elements now, but the the ending of this film is a really wonderful monologue where uh, Miss Downfire now has her own TV show, uh, and the kids are all watching it, and they they found a new way to be a family now. And a, a, a little girl writes into the show saying, "My my parents are separating. I'm scared. I don't know what it means. Um, I, I I and I'm just scared. And that's something that I I." was feeling at that time as well. And then Robin Williams, who is, of course, a, a hero, especially if you're in my age group and you grew up with Aladdin and stuff, just has this wonderful monologue about how there's a million ways to be a family. And some kids have one parent, some kids have two, some have four, some have grandparents or foster care. And no matter how different the family may look, like you'll, you'll be okay as long as there's love. And that was such a like generally very touching... A uh, thing and wonderful for me, and there's the line. I oh God, it's, it's stuck in my head now. This brought back a lot of memories yesterday. It was such a, it was a weird experience watching again. The line, um, just because they may not love each other anymore, doesn't mean they don't still love you. Mm. Especially when he's saying this in this sort of like, you know, impression of an elderly Scottish woman. But that was just like, yeah, it was generally a very comforting and sort of wonderful sentiment in this film that's meant to be about ultimately how. Uh, if you if you trust people and connect properly, that they you'll be okay, you know. Yeah, no, I, I do, and I do know, and I particularly noticed that uh, monologue at the end because it reminded me of one of my favourite sitcoms, which my family has watched, which is Modern Family, which sets up three at least at least three different types of family who are interconnected, and it also reminded me that I tried to get the. Um, stepbrother of my daughter into the same school using the sibling policy and the sibling policy was for uh full blood siblings half blood siblings wow. and if you were adopted but it wasn't for step siblings and i and i appealed and said this is wrong today's families include blended families like mm. mine and the next year they changed the rules to yes. include step um families so <laughs> It's, yeah. it's it's society people have made a box and like if you're frustrated at people or even yourself not thinking of the box remember that you made the box up and mm. even the often thing I remember Loki in this film this grade he is Mrs. Downfire this is the early 90s and at no point do they go a man looking after babies <laughs> oh I don't know how to use a hoover I'm a man it's just yeah it's yeah. It's, it's it's wonderful for that I'm gl I, oh, I'm so glad that school changed uh, we can yeah. do I've changed my mind. We can reform the system. Uh, <laughs> I'm always optimistic that mm. things will get better. There's no point getting up in the morning unless part of us believes tomorrow can be better than yesterday. Lee, thank you ever so much for telling us, uh, giving us your take on Mrs. Doubtfire. So your next film choice is the most uh, recent uh, of the movies that we are discussing today. It's Just Mercy um, that was um, released in 2020, directed by Destin Daniel Cretton, who then went on to um, 
film Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings, a Marvel blockbuster. Uh, but this movie is, uh, is very different. And I think it's the only one that we're discussing this evening that's based on a real court case, a real legal practitioner, which um, makes it um, sort of distinct from the others because the filmmakers have to work within the reality of uh, you know of what took place uh, but i think it works i think it's a great piece of cinema um, um and it stars michael b jordan as brian stevenson and jamie fox as walter mcmillan so that's my sort of introduction of the ingredients of the movie um but tell us susie your take on the film please the film is based on a book which is called Just Mercy, A Story of Justice and Redemption. And it's by Brian Stevenson, who's um, a criminal lawyer. And um, in the film, we see him as a, a very sort of young defence lawyer who's recently graduated from Harvard Law School. And he goes to a sort of centre where they, they, they um, defend people on death row or try and um, appeal people's conviction or sentence who are on death row. So he goes to the centre, which is based in Alabama, and he um, goes to prison and meets uh, his first client, who is Walter McMillan. And interestingly, this is another parallel, McMillan, uh, Walter McMillan, actually, um, his hometown is Monroeville, or Monroeville, and that's uh, the same hometown as Harper Lee. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, maybe there's something in this. <laughs> yeah, it's um, extraordinary, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So he meets um, Walter McMillan, who's on death row for killing a young white woman. And the jury has decided, uh, the jury were, uh, I think, 11 white men and a black man. And... Um, they decided that he should be sentenced to life imprisonment. But there was a judicial override by a judge called Robert E. Lee Key. (laughs) Um, And this judicial override decided that he should get the death penalty. So uh, Walter's there on death row, and I'm not really sure how much is embellished, because obviously um, Brian Stevenson is, is still alive, but, um, you know, they have the initial sort of young lawyer doesn't really understand old sort of ex, well, old convict. He's not that old, but um, by that stage, he's he's been, in, been on death row for a while and thinks, how can he help me? So you've got that sort of mm. whole setting, trying to sort of, um, Brian Stevenson is trying to win round Macmillan to trust him to, to, to defend him. So... Um, that's, I mean, there are other clients of Stevenson involved. I mean, there's um, Macmillan's cellmate who he goes on to represent and actually acquit. There's also another character who he represents, but, um, and that's partly set so that we see what the stakes are. We see um, another sort of client who he represents actually then get sent to the electric chair. So, so you know, for as the audience, yeah. you see that the stakes are high. If you, if you were in any doubt yeah. that they were, and so it's then the story of the the, the various appeals and uh, Brian Stevenson, the the lawyer, you know, um, investigating, finding sort of people had had lied, you know, even persuading people who had given false testimony to to change their testimony and, you know, fighting the system whereby I think they have four appeals before before we actually get to the sort of final showdown. It, it is that sort of, um, I suppose, inspirational uh, film that there's this guy who decides to set up with um, a, a, another lawyer who doesn't feature so much and she's played by Brie Larson in the film that you know that's what they've decided to set up because Congress has um, 
abolished funding for death row defence. So they, they set up their own centre, get funding and have to, I think this was, uh, this is about 1994 when, con- you know, the Republicans take over and decide, you know, that death row doesn't need any, fun- <laughs> you know, people on death row don't need any funding for appeals. So, um, yeah, they've decided that death means death. Mm. Uh, exactly. It's what, it's what and, uh, yeah. So, so it's sort of, it's political, it's inspirational. I remember um, speaking to colleagues in the office about it, and and lots of the my criminal colleagues, criminal the, who work in criminal defence, had seen it, and some of them, you know, in their younger days, had worked on, um, had gone over to the states and and done some death row volunteering sort of work. Um, because that's what the set, those centres now rely on people volunteering to gather yeah. the evidence. But, but I, I really like that storyline that it, it didn't just assume that this um, young Harvard graduate lawyer mm. would just be uh, sort of uh, believed in uh, by uh, Jamie Foxx's character, who of course has experienced you know a lifetime. Where the establishment has never um, stood up for him, even before he's falsely accused, he's he's someone who seems to live quite sort of you know hand you know hand to mouth and uh, and consequently um, would not be you know particularly uh, trusting in the system, whatever the race of the person in the suit that's been uh, you know that that that, that uh, arrives down the corridor. Uh, the the one aspect of the film that really affected me was when it's absolutely clear to anyone everyone even the furniture that the verdict was wrong the evidence is tainted it's the wrong person um the the prosecutor the police the mayor the sheriff the courts they just will not back down it's being shown to be wrong almost seems to be more what well, is to them is more important than the actual fate of this character and the resolution of this crime. And the victim is no longer in it. uh, And it's all about those institutions and those individuals saving face and preserving their reputations. Uh, Lee, you've you've seen it. Uh, Which bit struck you? Um, So there's two points. One of of them was just that the, the climactic moment comes down to the prosecutor agreeing with him. Which I don't know, I, I mean, Susie, you, you might actually know as a lawyer, like, what if that, that one prosecutor just went, no, I'm staying put, or just didn't agree? That's the thing that makes it, like, for the ending, feel so much like there's so much more to do. Because <laughs> obviously the system's still in place. Well, well to explain this, um, technically... Uh... It wasn't a judge that ruled in favour of Brian Stevenson. The, yeah. the prosecutor withdrew their objection to the motion put by Brian Stevenson to discharge the case, uh, but only after the prosecutor had been, hmm. oh well, I'm put under <laughs> impossible. I've, well, anyway, um, sorry. So that's that's the plot technicality you're talking about. But you you wanted to put this to Susan, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that certainly is something that, that does happen and it it happens here as well. So if you were appealing, um, you you know, prosecutors could pursue the, um, um, oppose your appeal or, or they could, um, and fight the appeal essentially, or they could actually concede it and say, well, actually, yes, you've got some good points. We're going to concede the appeal. Let's, uh, uh, you know, but we still go before the judge for a rubber stamp of that. So that's not unusual. And it's not to say that had the prosecutor not conceded that um, Brian Stevenson wouldn't still have been able to get an acquittal. Mm-hmm. So it would have just taken longer, oh, um, yeah. I think. Um, but it wouldn't, it d- wouldn't have meant that he wouldn't have got the acquittal. And also for the prosecutor at that stage when there were glaring holes and mm. you know that the four informants have, have actually been um, offered inducements to, to give mm. their testimony and witnesses have been suppressed and the original judge and I think the district attorney have um, basically nobbled the jury so that you've got um, 11 white 
mm. <laughs> pen on black guy. Um, and um, so I think by this stage, if you want to save face, you're probably going to have to say, "Yeah, I concede yeah. this." It was like, yeah, it seems to be the more the more dignified way of yeah. uh, of, of surrendering uh, to the inevitable at that at that stage. And of course, that prosecutor, uh, the the character Tommy Chapman, is played by the British actor Rafe Spall, mm. and Rafe Spall is currently on stage in the West End playing. Atticus Finch in <laughs> Kill the Mockingbird. In another extraordinary coincidence, he's he's um, he's moved from one side of the court um, to the other. Uh, Lee, any more remarks before I move to your um, second movie? So I think there's one one part of the film really does get into something that I think about a lot. Um, I mean, I can't remember when I started reading this. I remember so I, I did like home study of reading uh, psychology as a teenager. And I remember when I came across Elizabeth Loftus uh, and her work on basically proving that humans don't have memories, um, that human memories are not a recording, they're, they're messy and they're wrong, and you can basically input false memories um, into people in a conversation. I, what she did one study was like, there's 300, there's our 300 con- uh, people who were wrongly convicted in America and one side, two thirds were from like a false testimony. And some of those were people who genuinely believe what they were saying. And this film gets to the point where it's when the, um, when the guy is recanting his own testimony and now everyone's now saying, no, no, we don't believe you this time. Now, now we don't believe you on what you're testifying, but we believed you before. Uh, I think it just kind of highlights how, I mean, I, 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 I can't imagine how you go about running a law system and human testimony on both on both deliberately and undeliberately is so messy. And this film gets into that to a degree. Uh, yeah. Well, those of us who believe that evidence and reason, you know, will guide us, always guide us through the darkness to the light, uh, should pay heed to a line spoken by uh, Brian Stevenson, which I noted down, truth is distorted by the people in power. And, uh, you know, memory, evidence, what I said, <laughs> all those qualities uh, will come, you know, they'll, they'll take second place to, to privilege, to uh, uh, another another line in the movie, to wealth, race and status. Mm. So um, it's, a, it's a great movie. Uh it won't be as well known as some of the others we are, we are talking about. So hopefully some of our listeners will, um, will go off and watch that. Jesus Christ Superstar. Uh, that's a story familiar to many. Oh, yeah. Uh, and um, you've picked this and in particular, the the year two thousand uh, uh, movie version, yeah, um, to sort of to highlight uh, the role of trials um, within um, you know within this story, which of course are uh, you know legendary, and people still quote um, Pontius Pilate. But I won't make that quote in case you want to make it, <laughs> Lee. Uh, I won't steal that from you. That wouldn't be right. In the context of Jesus Christ Superstar, the musical in of itself, and we'll keep, I'll try and keep it in those bounds. Um, it, it just, it works so wonderfully, and I think it's so interesting in uh, the case of laws and trials, because they make it very clear everyone is using the law as a tool and is in turn powerless. It's, it's a, a, all the different characters, and it remains very sympathetic to people, because the thing that blows my mind with Jesus Christ Superstar is the starting point is let's tell the story of the final days of Jesus Christ and he's going to be the antagonist for like the first half. Judas is the main character and we'll be very sympathetic to him. Jesus is kind of being a jerk and it'll all come together and they tell you why the priests uh, and Pilate everyone has a reason for what they're doing Um, but they all ultimately um puppets even the people appearing to be in power so this is obviously pre magna carta um the law system is fairly arbitrary um but what sort of kicks off 
the uh, arrest of Jesus in this is um, the the priests are openly saying Caiaphas, especially in two thousand version, is incredible. Um, says that like we are scared that if these protests get out of control, the Romans are going to crack down on us, and a lot of people are going to get killed and hurt. Just to protect ourselves, we basically need to just let's just scapegoat this one guy, and that'll save a lot of people. Pilate is just scared of being blamed both by like the citizenry and by his bosses. And they just try and bounce Jesus around different legal systems to get a death penalty to take him off the board for their own protection. Because they even said a line, uh, was it? Uh, we turn to Rome to send us Nazareth. We have no law to put a man to death. I believe there, there were, but whatever. Um, yeah, and it, he just it, Jesus spends like the last half hour just being bounced around different legal systems trying to make heads nor tails of him. Um, and it's quite, yeah. The, the, the Jesus Christ Superstar is, I, I think, one of the best musicals ever made. It has lightning pacing. Um, this version, the 2000 version, has Rick Mayle as King Herod. Um, and interestingly, it's completely, like, uh, I've heard it described as a-religious. They never make clear... They sort of mention that people have that described Jesus as a god. They've mentioned that he's uh, performed miracles, but you don't see anything. And it's, it's, it makes it much more relatable to the struggles people are having in the film. As well as at the end, in the script, they don't. there's no resurrection. It, it just ends with the death of Jesus. They don't give you an easy out. They don't give you like, a, oh, no, no, he was divine. It was fine. It all worked out. Um and yeah, I think there's just a strong, strongest opening of almost any story, starting with Judas just begging his friend to listen to him because he's scared that the powers of B will crack down. Yeah, that's my mini Jesus rant. Yeah, and uh, and, yeah, and and so Judas is the part that most actors would probably want mm. um, from an actor's point of view if they were going to be in this piece, even though they're not the title character. And uh, I mentioned Pilate because, for me, uh, and I'm, a, I'm an atheist, but I, I'm furious at when people are given responsibility and power and they don't use it. I'd probably be less furious if Pontius Pilate said he's guilty, kill him, than when he said, uh, I, yeah, or didn't say, <laughs> yeah, I wash my hands a bit, let someone else. So, and I think there's, cause there's, there's a second betrayal. There's the betrayal of Jesus, the individual, and there's there's a there's a betrayal of one's duty, and and the duty to dispense justice is 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 so powerful and so important, you know, the duty to, to have power over life mm. and death. That for someone to uh, delegate it, I sorry, abrogate it, you know, to step aside, but but not actually step down from their position, for me, is I'm going to use the word is is it, that's an egregious mm. sin. And uh, uh, it makes you very cross, even though it happened a long time ago. And even the even the mob, even the mob. We talked earlier about the contrast between the rule of the mob and and the justice system. Mm. And uh, because the mob, I can't remember whether it's if it's in Jesus Christ Superstar, but it's in other versions uh, where they uh, the mob is allowed to free one of the three condemned, yes. and, and they ask for for Barabbas. Uh, and uh, by the way, I recommend the film Barabbas with Anthony Quinn, which then follows the life mm. of Barabbas. And even that point, I think, oh God, everyone, every now you've done that. So it's just is, is that no one here who's going to do the right thing? Really, just they just really want to apologise for Pontius Pilate. They just want to be like, look, and he's even said, "Can you like Jesus says to him in the Bible and in the show, like this isn't your fault." You've got no power here. This isn't. This isn't on you. I need to. Who? Sh can, I'm just. Can, you can free him. This really isn't on me. Yeah. I, I. But I still. I think the musical does a great job of humanizing him, where he's just. He's a man in an ostensibly position of power, but he's just got nightmares, and he's scared. He's worried, and he keeps. Obi saying, "There's no crime here. This guy. He's just like a sad little man. Let him go. Why? The, he hasn't committed a crime. I'm not. I can't enforce the law because there's no law that's relevant." until everyone shouts at him enough, and then Jesus won't answer him when he asks him to do something. He just gets annoyed and goes, all right, fine, all right, kill him then. We don't have a legal reason for this, it's arbitrary, but oh, fine. Uh, yeah, it's okay. Well, yeah, I mean, it's another strand, and, and we've, we've talked about this earlier, of, um, 
of the law and justice not being, you know, not being identical, and we hope that one will lead to the it's other. Just and people. a lot of these, mo- it's ultimately <laughs> just people. If if a judge says take that man away and put him in prison, and the guards and the bailiffs and everyone else in the room just goes, no, then he's just a, it's just a person in a chair. I'm going to mention my two films now. The first one, we do see divine justice. <laughs> it's not people. It's divine justice. Uh, and you can comment on that. It was, it, it's uh, Powell and Pressburger's 1946 movie, A Matter of Life and Death, which is uh, it's essentially two films in one. The first in colour, which concerns the fate of an injured fighter pilot on Earth who saves his crew but then has to bail out with no parachute. And the second is in black and white and takes place in the afterlife, or depending on your interpretation, in his imagination. But anyway, whichever place it is, there's a celestial court that has to determine uh, whether he lives or dies. Now, I love the parallel story technique, which seems very much ahead of its time, and is kind of copied in an episode of The Sopranos, when Tony is between life and death on the operating table. Uh, and it's got such great modern tropes because I, I rewatched it. Um, uh, as there's the eternal one, love across clashing cultures. Uh, and then talking of juries, uh, this actually has a, uh, a a diverse and more representative uh, jury <laughs> than the than the real ones <laughs> that we've seen in in, in our in our human films. Uh, they they have different national origins and dis- different uh, different races. Uh, also in the movie, and it's in 1946, there's a sideswipe against Britain's colonial mm. wars as well. And there's even a meta, a meta textual joke from an angel who talks about the black and white scenes that take place in heaven and says, one is starved of technicolour up there. <laughs> so uh, for all those youngsters, I don't want to watch a boring old fashioned old movie, most of which is in black and white. It's actually very modern. And it has that fantastic stairway to heaven set. And what we're here to talk about, epic courtroom mm. scene. Uh, with brilliant, uh, oh, the costumed extras uh, are fantastic. Uh, we talked about earlier the difference between law and justice, and and they, you know, they they um, they, you know, it's on the nose there. This is a court of justice, not of law. Is one of uh, is one of the lines, and there's lines such as "My case is the individual against the system," and and then there's that that beautiful line: "Nothing is stronger than the law in the universe, but on earth." Nothing is stronger than love, and I won't give away the ending. Uh, but I'll um, I present that to you uh, and our listeners. Have you seen it? Do you remember it? I, I watched it again, having first seen it quite a long time ago, and loved it just as much as the third time around. Yes, I have seen it. I love it. it it's um, I I must have. It's one of those films. I think from my childhood that I would have watched on like a Saturday afternoon that was on. BBC Two, when we only used to have three channels or whatever. Um, so I have seen it quite a few times, but a long time ago. But I, I, I remember loving the film, the whole idea of it, mm. and um, even the sort of ante room to heaven or whatever you call it, where the courtroom drama. Oh, yes, there's, there's a receptionist at a desk. Yeah. Yeah. And Richard Attenborough is a sort of. Clock scene as well. That was going to be my segue I was going to offer you at some point, which is, yeah, young Richard Attenborough appears in this film. And in 1993, he starred in the top grossing film, Jurassic Park, and the second highest grossing film in 1993, Mrs. Downfire. Uh, there's a marvellous last line mm. as well, um, spoken straight to camera, but I'm not going to give that away. Uh, so my second movie is one that really, um, I mean, really... Um, affected me as a youngster, probably my, uh, I don't know, 10, 12, and it's 12 Angry Men, directed by Sidney Lumet, his first film as a director. And it's, again, it's become it's become almost a cliche, uh, which is 12 jurors, 11 are convinced of the guilt uh, of the, the defendant, that's the word, <laughs> who we don't see, we never see, a young man accused of uh, murdering his own father. And it all seems an open shut case and they're all going to get home in time for tea with their wives because they're all men and I, they're probably all married as well because it is 1957. Uh, and then one right at the end suggests that perhaps they should, you know, perhaps it's time to just revisit, you know, one of the uh, of the aspects uh, of this case that has led 
uh, everyone else um, to conclude uh, that the person is guilty. And then bit by bit, it unravels and we introduce the various characters and uh, Henry Fonda starts to win people around. And I particularly love this, and I think uh, today as much as any other day, which is the, the, the minority views, the importance of listening mm. to and giving status to minority views, uh, however unfashionable uh, they may they may be, and also unconscious bias. Now that's that's not a that's not a two words I would have stuck together when I first watched it, uh, because the most adamant juror, who's absolutely convinced that uh, this young man uh, is guilty we found out later that he's biased because he is estranged from his own son and therefore is sort of projecting Mm. his hostility to his own son who has betrayed him and his love as a father and therefore wants this innocent man who i think i think he genuinely believes him to be guilty um to be punished for killing um his father but it's also just a wonderful set piece of drama it's virtually all on one set and uh, dialogue driven, the stakes are high, the language is great, the the editing is superb as people gradually throw more and more clothes off and get more sweaty and so on. Has all those ingredients. Which, but I haven't watched rewatched it, so this is based on my memory uh, uh, of being really struck by it uh, uh, at the time, and and the kind of the heroism of someone standing up and going, I'm now going to make myself extremely unpopular mm. because everyone everyone's convinced they're right and I'm wrong, and they also want to go home. So do I do it? I'm going to have to sacrifice. Oh, you know, there is a lot. Of, you know, there is a, a sacrifice involved in the stand taken by uh, by Henry Fonda. So over to you. Uh, do you remember it? Uh, have you watched it recently? Uh, I, I haven't watched it recently, but I I do remember loving this film. Um, I remember these. Yeah, I, I I agree with you. Luke. There's something very powerful in the. It's a. It's just. It's it's the bravery to listen as well. It's a film about just getting people like let's just keep communicating and keep thinking and connecting it out and then to get to a better place. Seeing a room full of men realize they're wrong as well and admit it. That's very cathartic. Um, well, it's also a liberal fantasy. Yeah. I admit that, which is that the liberal fantasy is that with 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 time and listening and reason, eventually we will always come to the correct conclusion because because the world is you know the world is like that, and it just needs one decent person to kind of point it out, and people eventually go, "Oh yeah, I'm terribly sorry. I was I was very wrong. You're now right." Susie. Yes, I, I have seen it, um, not not recently, mm. but yes, again, it's, you know, it's that uh, power of persuasion, uh, the arts of persuasion, um, and also the the, the courage um, to, to stand up and, and, you know, say what you believe. So, I yeah. And I wish, as I alluded to earlier, if only we lived in a world where that's all it took. Just yeah. one sensible, rational person to be brave enough, mm. and then eventually everyone will come around. Uh, uh, but nevertheless, it's, yes, it, it's very sort of um, well. It sort of has a strong belief in in, in the jury system, doesn't it? Mm. I'm not I'm not saying I I don't, but obviously mm. you you are going to get juries who just want to go home. So just say, okay, right, well, let's just you know. Let's just come to a decision because it's Friday afternoon or, or, or whatever it is, you know. Uh, I will. I'd like to also add that. So Sidney Lumet is one of my favourite movie directors. I'm just going to mention uh, his trial-based films because he went on to make quite a few. I mentioned one, a couple I mentioned earlier, Serpico and The Verdict. But late in his career, he was almost spoofing his, his earlier work because he made Guilty as Sin. Mm which is a real pot boiler with Rebecca de Mornay and Don Johnson. And it has like a, it's almost like an erotic thriller with with, with some courtroom drama. And then one of his last films was Find Me Guilty, stuck with Vin Diesel. Uh, And and that's that as a sort of comedy gangster. And so he started, you know, 12 Angry Men and, and, uh, and Serpico and Prince of the City and The Verdict. And then by the end of it, he was almost either lampooning or turning into you know, out and out um, sort of hedonistic melodrama. Well, when we were asked about this, like the film, I was trying, I was trying to think like, what is a good, what is a, a film where like the ending has 
something has changed, like the, the classic Hero's Journey society has transcended in some way, we're back to flux, the, the, the holding on to power status quo has been defeated. And the only one I can think of a court in a courtroom sense is, is Miracle on 34th Street. That's the only one I can think yeah. of where they <laughs> they legally <laughs> pronounce. Oh wait, no spoilers. Okay, um, <laughs> but there's a miracle. Miracle in this film. Miracle Street, which of course stars Mara Wilson, mm -hmm. who is uh, in Mrs. Doubtfire as the youngest yeah. of the three of Sally Fields and uh, and Robin Williams' children. But you don't want to give away the ending. Mm -hmm. What? Well, well, Miracle on 34th Street is a Christmas movie, so I'm glad you mentioned it to balance your Easter yeah. movie choice of <laughs> Jesus Christ Superstar. There's, 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 there's a lovely, there's a lovely um, sort of yin and yang um, symmetry there. Um, so those are the movies. Uh, the movies uh, about trials that we've put on trials. I recommend all of them if you haven't seen them. Um, for various reasons, uh, revisiting films that resonate differently now from when we first watched them, and uh, and films that you'll be seeing um, for the first time. So thank you for uh, bringing your suggestions. I really enjoyed talking about your movies, and thank you for indulging me and uh, uh, and talking a little bit about the two movies that I've also um, contributed. This brings us to the end of this episode of The Movies That Made Me, featuring movies involving trials. I would like to thank my guests, Susie Labinjo and Lee Apsey, and my editor, Andrew Payne. And I'd like to leave our listeners with a quote from Just Mercy, spoken by the lead character, Brian Stevenson, that seems particularly apt in our increasingly judgmental culture. Each of us is more than the worst thing we've ever done. This has been a Picard production.